Thank you all so much for having me here today. It's an honor to be speaking with all of you. Last year, when I spoke at the EWA conference about GDELP, I surveyed just a few of its myriad data sets and applications. Today, I'd like to dive more deeply into three of them. Understanding the evolution of language, mapping narratives, and even detecting future trends. Now, you know, before last year, the word COVID-19 wasn't even a word. Today, it's everywhere. Technical medical terms like coronavirus and spike protein, you know, those were in specialized medical journals. Today, they're even in local news outlets. Looking across the world's uh, news media in real time, over 150 languages over years, allows us incredible opportunities to, to really understand the real-time evolution of language itself. In this way, GDAL isn't just a web archive. It's essentially a live catalog of how we're using language and we can use tools to observe and catalog these changes in real time. So again, this graph right here won't surprise any linguists in the room, uh, but we can take in this particular case, I think this is maybe a month or so of, of English language news coverage uh, and actually catalog. So we, we use essentially uh, neural networks here to catalog the parts of speech. So we can take basically a huge corpus of English language news content and break it down by part of speech. So we can see, you know, nouns, we can see verbs, uh, punctuation. We can see all the different types of parts of speech. And this becomes very interesting because, again, linguists obviously, you know, know that let the English language breaks down like this. But what becomes interesting is we can actually compare these over time. So we can actually watch uh, changes over time. So we actually see language evolve essentially right before our eyes in real time. Um, we can also compare languages. So here we're taking a set and you know, we're comparing Chinese, English, French, German, Italian, and so on. Um, and we can actually compare and we can actually see the breakdowns here. So we can see, for example, adjectives and verbs. We can see how different each language is. Now, again, to linguists, uh, you know, these are not surprising findings here. But again, because we can observe this over time, over geography, over genres, we can actually see how this is changing. So we can actually observe these microscopic changes here. Um, now we can also look at you know, a particular genre. So here we're taking climate change. So here we basically collected a huge corpus of news, online news coverage uh, that mentioned climate change. And we basically look for every reference of climate change. And then for each time where it says the word climate change, we then had it say, uh, you know, the, uh, whether it was a noun, a verb, you know, the, we basically looked at each word that was being used there, the part of speech, um, its dependency uh, uh, within that dependency tree. We can, we can basically essentially take a particular corpus and look at our words used differently in this corpus than in other topics. We can, we can really start looking within a particular genre to say, are there interesting word usages in this genre that we weren't aware of? Um, and here's a, an interesting example here. So this is a collaboration with some linguists. And they were very interested, you know, the word cahoots. Um, typically, you know, you think about the word cahoots and you think about in cahoots. Uh, but they were very interested in alternative usages. So we can see here, you know, in close cahoots and some sort of cahoots, um, you know, going into cahoots. Uh, but then we can see, you know, without the word in, we can just see claiming cahoots, proves he is not in cahoots with. But then we can see interesting ones like Modi's cahoot. We can see political appointments, cahoots in theft of gas. We can see kind of these interesting uses where we don't see uh, some of that traditional context, kind of unusual case here. So we can essentially, again, just say, give me all the English language news covers that we've seen that mentions the word cahoots. Uh, we can basically extract out snippets, keyword and context, if you will, of all those, and then uh, using these tools, actually look at all the different ways it's used. Now, where this gets interesting is that, again, linguists, uh, they're used to a lot of these, but we can start showing some unusual cases that they maybe had seen before, but hadn't maybe thought it was a one-off, maybe a typo or so on. And we can show that, you know, these are not one-offs. These are actually systematic differences. I mean, these are regional differences that really hadn't been fully understood before. So again, looking at the power scale, we can start looking at word differences across time, geography, and genre. Um, and again, if we step back, we're starting essentially with this massive web archive. Uh, but instead of just web, or instead of just sort of shoveling it on the disk, we're processing it in real time through all these different algorithms. So, and then making all those resulting annotation data sets available. So at the end of the day with this web archive, instead of work files on disk, you have live data sets that very, very powerful annotations. So essentially transforming archives in the usable data. Um, but, you know, again, one of the things, oftentimes we want to go beyond word usage. So linguists oftentimes are very interested in how words are used, but oftentimes we want to look at the conjunction of those words. We want to map narratives, if you will, going beyond individual words to how stories themselves are told. 
Now, traditionally with GDAL, we've mapped narratives by looking at co-occurrences of entities. So for example, we'll take a large pile of news articles, extract out all the person names mentioned in that coverage, and then build these network diagrams that show what entities are co-occurring, whether that's person names or noun phrases or so on. We essentially look at co-occurrences. Now that allows us to analyze a specific narrative. So we can take, for example, here, carbon capture and, and sequestration, it's a clean energy technology. Um, and we can look at you know, how all the different people, we can look at kind of these, these big clusters here. So it's very useful for understanding a specific narrative but it doesn't help us if we want to take the fire hose of daily news and break into discrete stories and narratives. Um, so one of the things that we can do is we can look at textual overlap. So in this particular case, we essentially take the lead paragraph of every news article and compare how similar it is to the lead paragraph of every other news article. In our particular case, we use a rolling 30 minute window. So every, you know, basically throughout the day, we take every news article and we literally compare it brute force to every other news article across the 65 languages that we machine translate over the last 30 minutes. So again, brute force, huge amount of computing power there, um, and just basically tally up a huge data set essentially of here's, an, you know, here's a news article and here's every other article in the last 30 minutes and how similar it was to this one. Uh, and that, that's very, very powerful, but it does require exact word, word overlap. So for example, if one article talks about microchips and the other about the semiconductor industry, it won't know that those are similar but it does allow us to do very powerful things. So for example, here, we're taking wire stories. So this is uh, essentially a network diagram. Uh, we took a particular, I think it was a week or so, of all the wire stories that appeared in the news outlets that we monitor and how similar they were. So you can see, for example, we can take, uh, you know, say the Associated Press and uh, you know, we can compare how similar, you know, how many wire stories from the Associated Press's website were across all these other outlets and vice versa. So we can look at essentially how wire stories are are um, you know, distributed across the landscape. Now that's very powerful because we haven't been able to visualize, uh, build visualizations like this before to actually observe how wire stories move through the landscape in real time. Most importantly, because this is in real time, we can look for deviations. So we can say, ordinarily wire stories start here and they move this direction, but here's a story that's moving in the opposite direction. This is very unusual. So that allows us, because again, we can look at this stuff in real time. Um, and then we can look again, not just at exact matches, but we can look at, at, at um, you know, similar stories. So topics on similar, um, you know, how a particular story, um, you know, travels through the news media. And again, visualize this, see kind of the natural clustering of the news media. Um, we can also aggregate from outlets to languages. So we can see how languages, you know, which languages are similar, which ones are isolates and so on. Um, but again, all those tools I just mentioned, those all rely on words. So essentially they're taking the, the lead paragraph of each news article and just sh look computing how many words, exact words, are similar with every other article. Now, this is powerful, but this, this is, again, is highly determined, highly, de, um, you know, it's highly dependent on exact words. So, for example, if one article talks about nanochips, and another about microchips, another about the semiconductor industry, that isn't going to be able to group those together. So we need something to go beyond that. Now, you may have heard of something called embeddings. So embeddings is a whole field of research right now. Essentially, they use these giant neural networks. So essentially, they essentially hand out huge piles of content. They use these neural networks. They essentially build these graphs, if you will, of word co-occurrences. So they know what words co-occur with what words. And they essentially take, you know, for example, for English, they'll take the entire, you know, every word of English, and they'll group them together based on, on how often they co-occur. And so essentially, you get these, these giant vector representations uh, of them. Um, so in this particular case, um, you know, for example, you might have a 512 dimension uh, vector. So each word, essentially, if you think about it, it's, uh, you know, if you think about three dimensions, uh, you know, if you think about three dimensions like this, you know, multiply that up and each word essentially becomes a dot somewhere. And words that are, that are closer together tend to be more similar in, in usage. And what you get out of this essentially is, is essentially sort of these, these maps of words. So you can, you can start looking beyond individual word choices to the actual topics being discussed. Now, of course, one of the challenges is there's, there's so many word embedding models. There's, just, there's so many different models that have been built. Um, so how do we choose which one we want to use? And I'll come to that in a second. The end result is so far we've cataloged 250 million uh, art news articles we've converted to these embeddings across 65 languages, 190 million sentence level television news embeddings. So this is actually one of the largest open data sets for embeddings. And what this allows us to do is essentially semantically search archives. So with web archives, you know, most of them are just large collection of work files. Now, some people have made them keyword searchable, but then today you're just keyword searching. It's no better than Google essentially, but historical. Um, what we're able to hear is to do semantic search, to actually look across word usage. 
Um, now, again, there, as I said, there's so many different models, essentially these neural networks where, you know, in one direction comes the text, out the other side comes the vectors. So how do we select which one we use? Well, you know, you've got hardware requirements. A lot of them require all kinds of specialized tools. Um, there's a scalability. A lot of them are limited. They can only do a small number of words versus we want the ability to do all the, do uh, you know, entire documents, what languages they support, how well they work on news content, and most importantly, future proof. You know, we don't want to use a, a model, a, a tool that, you know, maybe is highly experimental. It might stop working in, a, you know, even a couple of weeks. You know, we need something that we can keep running for years, essentially. We can just put it on a virtual machine, uh, seal it up, and let it run, essentially, for, for years and years and years and years. Um, and so at the end of the day, we use something called the Universal Sentence Encoder V4. Um, it's an open model. Anyone can download it, use it themselves, which is very important to us. So, you know, if you want to be able to compare your own documents against our corpus, you can download this. Most importantly, it, it runs on CPUs. It doesn't require any of these fancy GPUs or any of these other accelerators. This is important because a lot of these neural networks today, they require specialized accelerator hardware uh, that, you know, can easily become unavailable. You know, if it's custom tailored for one tool and, and that piece of hardware isn't available anymore, you can't run that model anymore. So something that runs only on CPUs means that we can keep running this. It's future-proof, essentially. Um, now, what this, now here's it becomes a very interesting thing. So here we picked a, a fact check. We went to a fact checking website. We found this paragraph here, a video circulating on social media falsely claims that vaccines for COVID-19 have a microchip that tracks the location. So we want to see, we want to search essentially television news for appearances of this across television news. So here we pick some random sentences out of television news. And here we can see, uh, we have three different models, blue, orange, and gray. Um, and we can see the orange model is actually the one that we're ending up using, uh, the universal sense encoder model. These are some other models here. For each of these sentences, it says how similar it is to this paragraph up here. We see the most similar is this one. There is no microchip or tracking device attached to these vaccines. We can see that's the most similar to ours. Um, and the least similar is this one. There is no evidence of this. Um, so this sentence, again, it's similar in that it's about a falsehood, but it's not about COVID vaccines and so on. Um, so again, remember, we start with a paragraph here. You know, so traditionally, you know, how would you do this? If we want to see what fact checks, if I've got a fact check and I want to see how, how much is this being, you know, this, this falsehood about COVID microchips, how much is that getting covered on television news? Traditionally, I would, I would turn this into a bunch of keywords. I, as a human being, would sit down, convert this to a set of keywords and search them. Um, we don't have to do this. Again, we just handle this big pile of this paragraph of text. That becomes a, a vector. And we can just compare how similar it is to these others. Um, so again, we can do the same thing for online news. We can start searching all of online news for things. Again, you just take an arbitrary fact check. It's a paragraph of text and search entire documents. Um, and this is really powerful because, again, we can start with a, you know, we can take a paragraph of text. We can search and we can compare the similarity to any amount of text from a snippet to an entire book. Um, and this here again, we've gone. So here we actually took this and we searched across 100, almost 200 million sentences of closed captioning and said, give me the most similar sentences to this. Um, and this is an interesting one because you can see down here, nanochip. And it sees that nanochip in this particular context is the same as microchip up here, even though they use different words. So again, this powerful, this ability to, you know, I didn't have to sit down and, and come up with the keywords. I just handed a big pile of text, a paragraph of text, and just scan all this other. So again, this, this powerful ability to look across content. Um, you know, just, if I want to just say, you know, here's a random fact check. How often is this appearing across the news? Um, but what if I want to be able to visualize? You know, again, we have massive archives of content. What if we want to visualize that? So I can start off, I can do a keyword search for anything about COVID-19 and vaccines and take all the matching coverage in a single day. Then I can take those embeddings and I hand it the specialized software that visualizes it. And I visualize it here using three different tools. So this one, it looks like a point cloud, but in reality, uh, this is actually useful for finding certain types of similarity. Here I've asked it to look for the structure, start clustering similar articles together. And here's another visualization here we can see, you know, kind of very, very big clustering there. Now where this becomes powerful is, here's that same data set, it's an interactive tool, you can visualize it here. And I clicked on this article, full FDA approval for vaccine, Pfizer vaccine expected in early September. Um, so the target article is about FDA approval, but we can see down here it's matching other coverage about uh, Novavax, other vaccines, other things. We can see here all ac looking across languages. So again, I can click on a particular article and then see all the related articles across languages, and I can see clustering. I can see these kind of natural grouping. So it's like this ability to visualize uh, the narrative landscape of a particular topic. Um, and then finally, what will tomorrow's biggest stories be like? You know, we typically think of web archives like physical archives. We use them to look into the past. But GDAL is a real-time archive. It updates every 60 seconds. It's designed to both archive the past 
and observe the present as it happens moment by moment. This means we can look at the earliest glimmers of tomorrow's stories. But GDAL is also massive, which means that traditionally, you know, these time series analysis tools you typically use, they don't work at this scale. So we're using a new Google tool called Time Series Insights API, um, where we basically just hand it all of GDAL and it looks through it and it looks for patterns, it looks for essentially anomalies, things that are bursting in and uh, that weren't there before. So for example, um, you know, remember that GDAL was used to send one of the very first alerts about COVID-19. So you can see here, we're looking for pneumonia associated with any city. We're just basically looking for uh, pneumonia attached to any given city. We see this is, this is the graph for Wuhan. Um, and we can see all of a sudden the spike here, and then we can see, and then we can see it surge up. So here we can see, so this is actually December 30th, and we can see right here, you know, nothing, you know, not much, not much. Then we see this surge right here, 10 p.m. Eastern time on December 30th, 2019, we can see all of a sudden Wuhan burst into existence. Um, so again, remember, um, no one was looking, uh, you know, for SARS-like viral pneumonia of unknown origin on Wuhan, China on December 30th. Uh, but these tools can they do it. And so we actually think about GDL as this enormous archive of content. And we have these tools now that are capable of essentially taking this fire hose of content um, and detecting these anomalies for us. So not, you know, not just using web archives like physical archives to look into the past, but looking at them in real time, second by second, to actually observe um, you know, the, the present and the future. Remember, no one was watching Wuhan for pneumonia, but now we can look at data scale for these trends. Instead of just telling us about the past, Web archives can actually help us monitor the present. You know, imagine being able to scan the world in real time, turning archives into tools for now casting the present and even forecasting the future. Thank you so much for having me here today. It's so exciting. It's such an honor to be presenting to all of you. And hopefully this is giving you just a few ideas of how web archives can be used, not just to archive the past, but to help us understand the present and even see glimmers of the future. Thank you so much.